Hello, friends. We come now to the 24th chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith, dealing with marriage and divorce. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this very vital human institution, that which thou hast made on the model of the divine family and especially of the marriage of thy son Jesus with his bride, the church, help us to trace carefully, respectfully, but with subordination to thy word only at all times, the teaching of this particular creed, we beseech thee in this hour. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Of marriage and divorce, section one. Christian marriage is an institution ordained of God, blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ, established and sanctified for the happiness and welfare of mankind, into which spiritual and physical union one man and one woman enter, cherishing a mutual esteem and love, bearing with each other's infirmities and weaknesses, comforting each other in trouble, providing an honesty and industry for each other and for their household, praying for each other and living together the length of their days as heirs of the grace of life. So this too, you see, is an ordinance of God. It's ordained of God. And it too, as anything which is by God, is for the good of man. It's natural, and it's a normal state of most of mankind, but what we are told here is that it's not merely a coincidence that one man and woman find it convenient, feasible, practical to live together faithfully with one another, to have a family that's strictly their own, and so on. No, no, this is the way God has designed that man should live, and he has done so for the good of man and woman and child alike. And the mutuality of obligations and care and solicitude and the lifelong character of this union are spelled out here in utterly traditional manner. At some point, you know, the Westminster Confession is quite distinctive, but here it's saying something that just about every Christian would agree with, out of hand. This is the general Christian view of the divinely instituted marriage. Now, section two says, before the corruption of man, excuse me, because the corruption of man is apt unduly to put asunder those whom God hath joined together in marriage, and because the church is concerned with the establishment of marriage in the Lord as scripture sets it forth, and with the present penitence as well as with the past innocence or guilt of those whose marriage has been broken, therefore, as a breach of that holy relation may occasion divorce, so remarriage after a divorce granted on grounds explicitly stated in Scripture or implicit in the gospel of Christ may be sanctioned in keeping with his redemptive gospel when sufficient penitence for sin and failure is evident and a firm purpose of an endeavor after Christian marriage is manifest. Now see, there is a very definite departure from the Westminster Confession of Faith. In the original form, it has a great deal more to say about that practice. I won't mention all the details from which this present version deviates from the 1647 deliverance, but certainly the most significant is that originally only two grounds of divorce was recognized as biblical and lawful for a Christian person. Adultery and irremediable desertion. Now, our present form of the Westminster Confession of Faith, of course, still allows those grounds and admits they are biblical. How does it find grounds for broadening the base for the dissolution of the indissoluble marriage bond. 
How do they justify going beyond what Christ said with respect to adultery and what Paul said with respect to irremediable desertion? The answer is in this statement near the end. Let me read it once again. Remarriage after a divorce granted on grounds explicitly stated in Scripture, which is the way the old Westminster had it, or, here comes the new element, implicit in the gospel of Christ may be sanctioned in keeping with his redemptive purpose when sufficient penitence for sin and failure is evident and a firm purpose of an endeavor after Christian marriage is manifest. So this is the way the provision for divorce has been opened and has been opened more and more since these words were added. The two explicit grounds which the original Westminster Confession recognized, infidelity and irremedial desertion. These two are still affirmed, of course, but what is added are what's implicit. Now before I go any further, let me remind you that Westminster Confession itself recognized in the very first chapter of Holy Scripture that any just and necessary consequence from the Bible was the Bible. Anything that you could prove was expressly stated or indubitably implied had equal force as the Word of God. So appealing to the implicit is kosher as far as the Westminster Confession of Faith is concerned. I've mentioned before, it's one of the differences between traditional orthodoxy, such as we're reading here, and what's called the new or neo-orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy looks askance at implication or system. The old orthodoxy maintained that as long as those implications were sound, they were mandatory. So in a certain sense, though, this is the thinking of a new age. Nevertheless, when it appeals to the implicit, it's appealing to something which Westminster has always championed, and yet we're going to see, or well, maybe I should say, I'm going to try to show you. Maybe it's not here, maybe you don't see it here, maybe only I'm the one who sees it here, but I am going to see it, I'm going to try to show that what they're making implicit as a ground for divorce is not only a dubitable, I'm afraid it's specious, and that instead of drawing out the indubitable teaching of Scripture as implied, they're opening a Pandora's box, making the dissolution of marriage almost casual. Now, the implicit is what? Well, this is the way they state it. Since I'm being very critical at this point, let me be very careful in my reading of it. They say, implicit in the gospel of Christ. Now they're saying, you see, that the gospel of Christ, considered generally, implies there are more grounds of divorce than the two which are stated explicitly. I see in a very delicate situation here. There is such a thing as a valid implication. There is such a thing as an invalid implication. Now, is the supposition that there is any number three, if this is number one and this is number three, that there's a three, four, five, and six, and so on, is the very suggestion that there's a possibility there's a number three, a number four, etc. Itself, right? Well, you can see it's a very, very delicate situation. Christ tells us if a man puts away his wife except for the cause of adultery, porneia, fornication, he causes her to commit adultery and so on. It's a sin. Paul says, unless the person unbelieving will not remain with you, you are bound, but if that person will not remain, deserts, then you are not bound. And now those two reasons are given. No other reason is expressly stated, 
Except death, of course, I'd understand. That dissolves a relationship. That's taken for granted, that's understood, it's assumed throughout, but no other reason is stated. Now, can I say incompatibility? Can I say, if I find it hard going with my wife, or more difficult than I thought, or more difficult than it's worth, and it causes me so much distress and sorrow, it can't counterbalances any of the joys and benefits I get in marriage, that marriage is no longer achieving its function, and that therefore I may, or she may, dissolve the relationship? Can I say, that's according to the gospel of Christ, because Christ wants happiness for Edna and John, for Mary and Tom. And they're not going to have happiness in the marital relationship, and the gospel doesn't want people to be unhappy. And if they can be happy, unmarried, or married to other people, isn't the spirit of the gospel saying, Divorce under those circumstances, as long as it's accompanied. Now remember what is also said. There must be sufficient penitence. I must be sorry for my contribution to the grievance in the family. She must be sorry about her contribution. She's not without fault. I'm not without fault. I may have more fault than she, but she's not devoid of any fault. And so on. there has to be penitence on both our parts and admission of failure. We have to acknowledge that it isn't a fault in the institution that God has ordained. It's a fault in her and in me, and so on. And so I'm acknowledging, and she's acknowledging to God, it's not his fault, it's our fault, and we're sorry about the fault. But nevertheless, it has made the marriage non-viable. And there's, so there's got to be sufficient penitence for sin and failure and a firm purpose and endeavor after Christian marriage. I have to say, and she has to say, we have really tried, Lord. We know this is of your establishment, that marriage is your will, and we entered into it in good faith, and we've really tried to make it the institution you intended it to be. John acknowledges and I acknowledge, says Edna, we're at fault, not you. We're sorry. But nevertheless, we are not able to overcome our weakness in this regard, and marriage is sadder than it is happier. It's not realizing what we think you intended, and we do claim before God that we have really tried. We've been married for years. We put up with a great deal of stress and strain and unhappiness at many points because of the sacredness of this institution, and we've asked you for help time and time again, and though we'll take the full blame for it, at the same time, we have tried, and we are genuinely penitent, and we do feel that it's in the spirit of our God and Christ our Savior that we should no longer be bound together in the bonds of holy matrimony. Can I say that? See, that's virtually what's being suggested here. You come back against the words, one man, one woman, nothing should render us under what God has joined together. Adultery does it because one spouse is united to another person, and by definition, marriage is a union between one man and one woman. Not one man and two women, or one woman and two men, but one man and one woman. And adultery destroys that because it's a union now between one spouse and two of the opposite sex. And that's not marriage. It's destroyed. It's killed. And therefore, if the innocent party wishes to put apart the person who has killed it, not by his general imperfection, but by his specific adultery, or hers, has a right to do so. That's the way Christ seems to reason. And the church here, and the church right unto the modern times has said, the innocent party, the person who has not committed adultery, not devoid of all offense, not innocent in any total sense of the word, but innocent of actual intercourse with someone not the spouse, and so on. That person who commits infidelity has dissolved the marriage, and the innocent party has a right to be separated and to be united with another person. That's spelled out. 
and very carefully. Only that is mentioned by Jesus Christ. Along comes Paul, and he takes a case just as ultimate as that. If the one member of the marriage separated irremediably, where's the marriage? It's gone. He or she may as well be dead. There is no marriage. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, the one who abides faithful is no longer bound. He's no longer married, apparently. Free to enter a legitimate one. All right, but how careful. Nothing else in the Bible suggested and so on. Now we come along and we say, yes, but since the gospel of Christ is redemptive, such at me, since it means the overcoming of grief and sorrow and stress and strain and bringing of peace and joy and happiness and so on, then a marriage which is basically unhappy for whatever reason, it really can't be what God meant. Therefore, it's not really marriage. Therefore, it may as well be dissolved. And if the parties wish to try again with someone else, sincerely and penitently because of their past failure, why not do it? <laughs> this is a case where I think the uh, moderns are absolutely wrong, and yet I have a tremendous amount of sympathy for them. Their reasoning is pretty cogent, and it goes along the lines I have just said. And it's <laughs> implicit in a certain sense. But uh, I even though I, I confess my own weakness in trying to give an adequate uh, criticism of that. But uh, I think uh, the way I would put it is this. It's the fundamental principle that what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That's the fundamental principle. Nothing is to separate it till death do its part only. That's the vow at the altar and so on. Two solitary exceptions made. Otherwise, no exception, no rendering asunder. This is for life, it's indissoluble. Death alone separates legitimately, and so on. Adultery, which virtually separates in life, and desertion, which adultery, the Bible specifies. To go beyond that, and especially almost unlimitedly beyond that, to anyone, to any family, to any marriage which seems strained and short of the realization of the perfect ideal constituting a ground for the dissolution of a marriage which is meant to be till death do us part, that freezes me. That seems to be an abuse of the principle of the implicit. And I say that when I'm giving full credence to it, forgetting for the moment what's actually happened. My dear, if some husband fails to say good, good morning to his wife, or some cruel word passes in a day, that's enough justification for the dis. And anybody can get a divorce for just about any reason. And the church isn't doing anything much to describe it, it is, to defy it. It's, of course, disapproving of it. It's deploring it and so on. But it's not warning its people this is absolutely a violation of the will of God about the holy institution of matrimony and so on. Just seems to me utterly incongruous with it. But at any rate, there's a situation. Here's the classic position articulated in 1647. I still think it's the truth, and the only limitation that we have on the indissolubility of the marriage vow would be those to go a whit beyond that, under the banner of the implicit and so on, I think is without justification and very, very dangerous, liable to the abuse which we see on every hand at the present Time. At the same time, may I remind you, unlike the Roman Church, which defends the proposition of the absolute indissolubility of the marriage contract, the Christian Church of the Reformation and uh, the Westminster Confession has said the Bible itself, the Word of God itself says, there is such a thing as a legitimate divorce in this life. And if it is a legitimate divorce, then presumably the legitimately divorced person has a right to enter a legitimate matrimonial contract with another person, appropriate person, and so on. So while we are facing today in Protestantism what is incredible latitudinarianism and an opening of the gates wide to divorce on almost any ground and acceptance and continued acceptance in the Christian community, on the other hand, the extreme is no give at all, and people actually refusing to allow divorce under any grounds when Christ himself did allow it and Paul himself did authorize it. 
And while Rome stands on the principle once again of the indissolability under any circumstances of the marriage contract, I know some Protestant minister friends of mine, some of them, who will take a step in that direction and say to someone who has been legitimately divorced because the spouse was unquestionably unfaithful, that he will not marry that person, innocently divorced, who according to Christ's own words has not offended and has a right to be remarried, then I would say my minister friend at that point is depriving a Christian person of a right which God through Christ and the apostle give to that person. And that a minister has no right to withhold from people what God gives to them any more than he has a right to give to people what God withholds from them. The fundamental principle of the Bible and the Westminster Confession of Faith is God alone is Lord of the conscience. And we believe the Bible because it's the Word of God and the authority of the Bible for that reason and that reason only. And we believe what we believe and do what we do and practice as we do for one reason because God has so commanded and we avoid and forbid what we do, avoid and forbid for one reason, because God has forbidden it. That's the fundamental principle. It all begins and ends there. To God be the glory, thou shalt have no other gods in my presence. He alone is the Lord of the conscience, and he alone we must follow. We come now to another section altogether. We've been dealing, you see, with uh, secular affairs in a certain sense, human government, Christian liberty, the civil magistrate, oaths, vows. Now we're turning to the church. We discussed the relationship of the church and state. Now we're talking about the church in and of herself. In chapter 25, we have of the church. Section one, the Catholic or universal church, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ, the head thereof, and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now there's a definition of the church, a very comprehensive definition in terms of the invisible church at that. You understand that term, invisible church. It isn't that true saints are less visible than hypocrites are. What is invisible about true saints is their trueness. What's invisible about the faithful is their faith. You hear what they profess which is faithful, and you see their behavior which is in accordance with the, with the doctrines of faith, but you don't really see what motivates them. You don't know their hearts. God alone is the searcher of hearts. So in that sense of the word, their faith is invisible, and those who assemble together in the name of Jesus Christ constitute the invisible church because those who in that profession of Jesus Christ are really sincere have their sincerity hid from the eyes of, eyes of men. We can't see it in that sense of the word. We can only hear what's said and see what's done, but we cannot penetrate or intuit the motivation of it. And that's where real Christianity locates, in the heart. As the saying is, the heart of religion is the religion of the heart. That's where it all is. It comes through the head, but it locates here. But there it's invisible to anyone except God infallibly and to the person himself possibly. I say possibly because even the person himself may misconstrue his own experience. But certainly he alone can know it, not I not his spouse, not his best friend, not his confidant. Only he can know it if any human being can, and only God knows it perfectly. So that's the sense in which the church is invisible, but visible, of course, to God. But please notice that section one includes the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one. See, that means that the church includes the elect who have died, for example, or are in heaven now. They're a part of the church. And there are elect persons yet to be born and to be regenerated 
and become members of the invisible church. But according to the definition of Westminster, the church, as the Bible defines it, is that invisible body of the elect who were, are, and shall be, whether in heaven or on earth, as the case may be. It's an, it's an interesting thing, you see, that, uh, that uh, it applies to the invisible in heaven persons who aren't in any way visible to us. And, of course, the future generation is at this moment utterly invisible as well. But nevertheless, members of the church, it says. Now we come in section two to what we usually call the church, the visible church, which is also Catholic. Remember the word Catholic, Catholic means universal. We are a universal church. The Protestant church is a universal church. The Catholic church is not a Catholic church. The Catholic church is a local church. It is only that body of people who recognize the Pope as the head and a certain body of priests as the Ecclesia Dockens and those who listen to them as Ecclesia Audiens. That is the total church. The rest of us may be separated from it or totally out of it as the case may be, but the parochialism of Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, is very evident in that it's restricted to a certain body of professing Christian. We, for example, as Protestant denominations, really are Catholic because we say we have no monopoly on the church. Any true believer anywhere at any time is a member of the church of which we too are a branch, but a branch. We're not the whole church. As soon as any church says it's a whole church, any denomination says it's a whole church, it can't be the church at all. The true church is a Catholic church. If I didn't recognize everybody who's a Christian, I wouldn't be a Christian at all myself. Some Protestant groups do that too, you know. They define it so narrowly that the church of Jesus Christ are only those persons who agree with every tenet of their particular group, and they exclude all the rest of us. Well, as soon as they do that, they don't exclude us, they exclude themselves. Because the church, as the creed rec correctly says, is in the wall, uh, whole world. It's ecumenical in the sense that it's Catholic, it's Catholic, it's universal. Wherever I meet another person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, I meet a fellow member of the Christian church, whether he catches, carries the Baptist label or the Lutheran label or the Episcopal label or the Congregational label or the Christian label or whatever label he happens to take. If he bears the name of Jesus Christ, not a counterfeit such as Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or Christian scientists who deny the name of Jesus Christ, but a person who really affirms it, then he's a brother in Jesus Christ and he's a part of the Christian church of which I consider myself fortunate to be a member also. So please remember, the Protestant church is Catholic, the Catholic church is, is parochial. What goes by the name of Catholic church, that is. The Roman Catholic church is parochial. The visible church which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, not confined to one nation as before under the law, consists of all those throughout the whole world that profess the true religion, together with their children. It's the first time it mentions the children. I don't know why it wasn't in section one, but it is there now. And is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, through which men are ordinarily saved, and union with which is essential to their best growth and service. Our time is just about up, so I'll just have to mention in essence here, this is indicating, you see, what constitutes a true church is a profession of what's essential to the Christian religion of persons together with their children. Now, the Baptists, you know, would not agree with us on that. We include the children as well, and we show so by the visible sign of uh, infant baptism and so on. But they are included together with those who uh, profess, and usually that is the way they are brought into union with God, that is through the church. I wouldn't have God for my father, said Augustine, unless I had the church for my mother. That is to say, most people come to know Jesus Christ by means of the witness of the church and members thereof. Faith comes by hearing, and the hearing comes from the lips of members of the church, and that's the way other persons are brought into the membership of the church, and union with that church is essential to their best growth and service. Now, there's a minor point at which I would differ and will differ when we resume again in our next continued study of the nature of the church according to the Westminster Confession of Faith.